Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacobina Mutenya, and I would likely, I would humbly want to welcome everyone who's joining us today, especially our speakers and guests of honors. Um, I'll start with Ms. Emmy Bray, who is a data scientist at Zinti Africa. And then I'll also uh, like to welcome Dulcy, who's representing uh, Dr. Gisel Corey, who is the executive director, uh, Data Kind in the UK, as well as Ms. Rusa Ipinge, the executive director of uh, We Are Capable for Good Namibia. And she's also the Zindi ambassador in Namibia. And uh, we also want to welcome Mr. Mike Okero, who is a data scientist from Uganda. Um, I also want to welcome everyone who's participating today. Uh, and we are all here today uh, because we want to discuss uh, data, not only to define what is data, but also to understand and appreciate the value that we can get from data when it comes to uh, solving social and humanitarian uh, challenges. Um, this is also known as uh, data for good. Uh, so, uh, welcome all of you, and I would like to hand over uh, to the next speaker, who is uh, Miss Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I'm Amy, I'm the data scientist at Zindi. I do have a tendency to talk really quickly, so that is the problem. Just yell, and I'll slow down. Oh. Um, so, Zindi is a community of data scientists solving Africa's toughest challenges. It's also the largest online pan-African community of data scientists. Um, one of our sponsors, Lauren Mutugo from Microsoft, put it so nicely, the only way we are going to fix Africa's problems is with African solutions. Um, and this is where Zindi comes in. Zindi was started because a consulting company was asked to create a data science course uh, for a university and they were asked to use African data sets um, and there weren't that many of them. So there's this missing piece of Africa that they were finding. Uh, so Zindi was started in September of 2018, so we're almost two years old. Um, some stats in our two years is we've now got 14,000 data scientists working on Zindi together. Um, we've got 5,000 Twitter followers and Zindi gets 150,000 page views a week. So we're on the tip of people's tongues in Africa and we're starting across the world. And very proudly, 35% of our audience is female. Um, so the idea behind Zindi is we go to clients who have data, who have a problem, and who think that machine learning can enhance their business. We work with them to make sure we are answering a real problem using real data, and we give it to our 14,000 data scientists to work on. Um, the likelihood that an African data scientist is gonna get a job in Africa is very high. So we want to prepare them by working with real data and real challenges. As we've launched 44 competitions and 13 hackathons, we've given about 70 solutions uh, created by our data scientists to corporate companies and to NGOs. Many of these solutions are being implemented and put into practice. Uh, we have up to 1,500 data scientists competing in challenges, and we've given $70,000 uh, to data scientists. Very excitingly, we launched our first Pan-African virtual hackathon, um, and it had over 1,000 university students participating in. So very exciting. This may seem a bit intimidating and a bit scary, but um, there's competitions, there's hackathons, there's people. Um, and if you're new to your data science journey, it can be quite intimidating. One of our users, Lawrence Mururie, uh, started his first challenge in, I think it was October, um, just after Zindi launched. 
and he was in the bottom quarter of a leaderboard. Nine months later, he won a challenge and he said there's no losing on Zindi, only learning. Um, and I think it's a great story, something we should always remember. I'm just going to walk you through some of the challenges we've done and then I'm going to walk you through our platform. So we've often used satellite imagery for identifying crops, um, a really awesome computer vision challenge. We work with nonprofit organizations and NGOs such as Childline Kenya. We did a problem where we forecasted the number of calls per hour. This is the one Lawrence won. Uh, we've worked with a Ugandan company, Zente, to predict the likelihood of loan defaults. Um, this is our newest challenge and it's very exciting. We're talking about implementation of the solution now. Uh, this is to predict air quality using weather data in Africa. In Europe and the States, there's lots of air quality sensors, but in Africa, there's a missing gap. So um, using that and hopefully policymakers can look at that. I'm now going to walk you through just the platform to make you become comfortable with it, show you a couple places where there's tutorials. Uh, so this is Zindi. When you want to sign up, it's really easy. You just go to the top corner over here and say sign up. Uh, I'm going to start by showing you our blog page. On our blog page, you can meet the winners so you can read about their solutions, <coughs> uh, see how they did it. You can also meet our ambassadors. So we've got ambassadors um, Paul will correct me, but I think we have 30 ambassadors across 16 countries. Uh, so, and this is where we have our lovely Rusa from Namibia. We've also got tutorials. So this is if you're new or if you're quite a mature data scientist, um, tutorials to um, expand and for you to grow. Next, we have our discussion board. Uh, newbies use it along with the pros. So it's really nice to see what other people are struggling with and where you can support them and also where you can learn from others. Here we have our data scientists page. Um, data scientists earn points and that's how they rank. You win points if you're in the top 10 of a challenge but every time you make your first submission for a competition you get five points. So you can work yourself up the leaderboard. Next we have our competitions. Uh, so at the moment, we've just had a competition close for $10,000. Um, and this was to predict flood extent after a hurricane in Malawi. Um, I want to show you a knowledge competition. Knowledge competitions are great if you're new to machine learning, new to AI. Um, they stay open always. You're allowed to make 30 submissions. You can make numerous mistakes in one day and you're still good. Uh, you have your description, you have your rules, you have your evaluation. So the evaluation is your accuracy against the test set. Um, knowledge competitions, we're aiming to put tutorials on them. This particular challenge has a video uh, written and a notebook tutorial to get you onto the leaderboard and another set to improve your model. Uh, on the data tab, this is where you can download your files and read about the data. You have, we often give you a training file, that's what you train your model on, um, and then we give a test file. So you test the model that you built, and then you submit uh, a CSV file. All competitions have a sample submission, so you know what your submission file needs to look like. Uh, the way you submit is you just go over there. Uh, the Zindi, we automatically score it, your submission for you, um, and you land on the leaderboard. So here we have this team who got a log loss score of 0.019. They're in second place and they've made 52 solutions. Um, so Zindis is a really exciting competition platform. 
but more than that, it's a community and we're really excited to see it grow in Africa. Um, I'm going to stop and pause. Does anyone have any questions? Anything they want to go over? Um, Amy? Hi, yes. Yes, uh, I would like to ask a question. Sure. I would want to find out how does, um, how does one, like for example, if there's someone who has a challenge that wants to be solved, like what is the process to submit um, the challenge and how can one also participate, like if we have people who want to participate in executing uh, the challenges, how do they go about it? Uh, so if you know someone who has data, has a problem, you can email me, that's amy at zindi.africa, or you can message zindi at zindi.africa and we'll jump on a call with you, um, see how we best can help you um, with a hackathon or a competition suit you better. Um, yeah. And as soon as you see a challenge come out, just jump onto the challenge, jump onto the discussion boards, uh, ask for help in solving them. Okay. Uh, do you have like pre pre um, charges that you charge, like already set up charges, or are they only discussed after you submit the data? So we do have charges, but we also work to fit into someone else's budget. We don't want that to be a hindrance to sharing of knowledge um, oh. and improving data scientists. Okay, right. thank you. Um, someone asked about the discussion boards. I'm gonna share my screen again. So the discussion boards, uh, you have a discussion board for a competition so these questions are specifically for this challenge. This challenge is quite interesting, very topical at the moment, just to mention. Um, it's called Spot the Mask Challenge. So can you predict if someone's wearing a mask um, or not wearing a mask? So you can impress someone cool by going through these tutorials this weekend and saying that you can create a machine learning algorithm to detect if someone's wearing a mask. But here we have our main discussion page so if you want to ask a question to the general public, you can, um, or you post in a competition uh, discussion forum. Okay, um, so we don't have any other questions. Can we move on to the next speaker? Dulce? Yes? Um, you're next. Ah, oh, lovely. Sorry, sorry. Um, I will just share my screen then as well. Um, first, though, I'd just like to say hello and, and thanks so much for, for having uh, Datakind UK here. Um, uh, it was really great to hear more about Zindi. Um, what, a, what a great tool. Um, so let me just get my slides. 
Uh, and I should say that I'm here on, on kind of behalf of our executive director, Giselle, whose uh, <laughs> internet has helpfully broken. Um, okay. Can everyone see the slides okay? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Wonderful. Um, okay, so please, please jump in at any time with, with questions in, in the chat. Um, so today I was just going to tell you a little bit of um, some stories um, about our work uh, helping to do data science um, for good in the UK social sector. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about who Data Kind UK is. Um, I wasn't sure, you know, how many people here would be data scientists, how many people might be here representing organizations. So I'll touch briefly on what data science is and then tell you some stories of um, how we have found it helpful to apply in um, charities, local government and other kind of social sector organizations. Um, and then I'll share maybe some tips on how you or your organization can get started um, with data science um, for good. So uh, DataKind UK is part of a um, bit of a global network of DataKind chapters. Um, and we're a charity who aims to build the capacity of other charities in, this, in the social sector to use data effectively. And so we do this by working with organizations to uh, help them explore what might help them make decisions, introduce them to new tools and approaches, and then also provide them with um, a kind of peer support network as well uh, to help build their skills over time. Um, this particular chapter of DataKind was founded in 2013. Uh, we have worked with organizations big and small. Um, some, some do have a global presence like Oxfam, for example, um, Amnesty International, while others are, are quite UK specific. Uh, so we've worked with, for example, local food banks. Um, nonetheless, I think a lot of the stories kind of should translate. And I want to say right off the bat that we are able to do this work because of a network of hundreds of industry data scientists volunteers um, who uh, work uh, typically it's with like finance or tech or sometimes in, in academic research um, and they give their time uh, volunteering our projects for us. So in terms of uh, what we do, we run several different programs for charities and, and nonprofit organizations ranging from very kind of light touch support to uh, longer term projects up to say a year. So like on the, on the lightest end, uh, we offer what we call uh, data therapy. <laughs> um, so this is very, it's like a one hour consultation where, where um, organizations are able to come in and get, uh, ask really any data related questions. So this could be something quite technical, like how do I get started using a programming language like R, or it could be something like what data should I even I try to be collecting? I would say that our um, our core project is um, what we call our data dives, and these are short, typically three month projects that are focused on helping organizations with um, some exploratory analysis and kind of proto prototyping. So what we do is we work with organizations to help them define the most important questions to them um, and help them prep and clean up their data set. And this culminates in a kind of two day hackathon style event that um, brings together data scientists and the charity partners to work on specific questions. Uh, and I'll tell you some stories of um, some of these particular projects in a minute. Uh, we also have these longer term projects, which um, are called data cores. We have um, American lineage. Um, and rather than something exploratory, this is um, deploying something to be incorporated into how the organization operates. So I think uh, even some of the examples um, that were uh, mentioned in the, the Zindi challenge might fall into this kind of category. So it might be developing a tool to help um, help a, a client predict um, who's going to be at need or who might be. We, I don't think we would necessarily do the mask challenge, but uh, something like that, a predictive model. 
And then um, we also have a, a peer support um, society called the Social Data Society, which is a group of um, social data scientists working in the social sector. And this was um, in, generated in response to the fact that uh, a lot of people trying to do data science in the social sector, as I'm, I'm sure many of you have experienced, are kind of on their own. They might find themselves um, a bit isolated. And so we thought it was important for them to have a community to talk to. And I think it's, it sounds like uh, forums like the Zindi discussion boards as well would be a wonderful place um, to, to gain support and, and build up your own skills and network. Uh, then lastly, uh, one thing that is very important to us is uh, fostering a kind of global dialogue about responsible data use. And I think this, this has become even more in the news as of late. Um, and so we are trying to sort of do this through um, uh, written pieces. Uh, for example, we most recently did a piece uh, looking at how, how to assess uh, whether your algorithms are biased. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, what data science is and then how it can be applied. Um, I think as, as many people here know, um, data science, in my view, is really just a kind of fancy 21st century uh, term for using tools to gain insight and knowledge from data. And I imagine that some people might have seen this, this um, data science Venn diagram. Um, the tools that data scientists tend to use tend to be a combination of, of typical math and stats knowledge, along with kind of programming or hacking skills from computer science. Um, but for, in our view, what's really important is that uh, we need somebody with the domain expertise. And for us, that, that comes from the social sector organizations. Um, we really need those people to provide the context and, and the guiding questions uh, in order to answer, um, use data to answer questions that, that matter. So now just for some examples. We found over the years that um, there's, I think, four main ways that data science can be used uh, well in, in the social sector. Uh, we have yet to sort of find a, a project that doesn't really fit into one of these um, buckets. So that would be understanding need and demand. So um, where in my country, in my local area, is there a, a high need for our services is a common question that we're asked. Um, understanding clients. So we often have uh, people wanting to know, you know, what, what proportion of our, our clients are um, elderly, what proportion of our clients also have long-term disability needs, that kind of thing. Um, where are our clients based geographically? Um, evaluating services. So for example, we have organizations come in and say, we run several programs and we kind of have a suspicion that it's really not working well for you know the young women in our group or it's not working well for the young men in our group uh, could we see if that's actually true that instinct and then lastly is improving operational efficiency so is there a way that we can use prediction to improve or, or augment uh, decisions that humans normally make um, so I'll tell you a story about each of those kind of cases. Uh, this one is um, a story about some work that we did with an uh, app called Streetlink, uh, which is made by Homeless Link, which is a charity here in the UK. Um, so with this app, uh, any member of the public can send an alert if they notice somebody who uh, they suspect is sleeping on the street. And the purpose of this is that um, Homeless Link will then send a support worker to offer further help. Uh, which the the person can accept or reject as, as they see fit. So Streetlink here wanted to know whether the number of alerts that they were getting in their system actually was representative of the number of people, um, of homeless people sleeping outside, um, or whether it, it reflected something else. So um, on this graph, uh, I'm showing you in, in blue is the real data looking at the number of uh, alerts that they were getting through the app um, over the course of time. Uh, and here, uh, the, the volunteers modeled this data using only two variables. So the weather, basically how cold it is outside, um, uh, and the Twitter activity. So how active Streetlink had been on social media promoting their services. And they found that these two variables were really enough to predict the um, number of alerts that they would be getting. So rather than, um, we, we don't have sort of causal evidence, but this suggested that really the alerts that they were getting don't actually re represent 
the number of um, people sleeping uh, rough outside. It was just a reflection of social media activity and how cold it was. Um, but this was helpful because it kind of um, gave them some information about what they were actually measuring, what the demand actually reflected, um, and they could also use it to uh, use social media to kind of increase the amount of traffic that they were getting through their alert system. So the next story I'll tell you is about understanding your clients. And this is some work that we did with a charity called Buttle. And they uh, provide financial support for families and young people in, in crisis. And they, they noticed over the years that a lot of issues that people were experiencing were connected, as, as you might imagine. Um, and they wondered if they could better support people who come in with uh, uh, one issue by anticipating potentially what their next issue might be. So here in this in this image here, the the circles uh, represent the volume of, of requests they were getting about that particular topic and then the arrows show the sequence. So uh, one thing they found um, was that people who were get, requesting help about their child's health would, would later come in often with questions about their own mental health issues or their own health. They also found that um, people who came in with questions about or issues relating to domestic abuse um, so down the line may end up uh, with issues relating to homelessness or uh, family estrangement. So they had kind of hunches about some of, some of these connections, but um, this is helpful for them to sort of predict predict future need rather than waiting for somebody who uh, comes in initially with uh, domestic abuse uh, issues um, to, 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 for that to escalate even further to something like homelessness. And so the next story I'll tell you is about um, um, some work about evaluating programs, which is we did with a Welsh charity called Clamai. Um, and they are uh, a charity who works to reduce youth homelessness. Um, and, and they had a kind of instinct, um, much like the, the one I mentioned, where they suspected that there were some people who weren't doing well in their, in their programs. So what they did here was they um, segmented their um, clients, the, the young people in their programs, based on whether they were a care leaver, so whether they'd been in um, like institutional care or foster care, um, and whether they were a youth offender, so whether they'd been involved in the, in the justice system. And for each user, they looked at uh, how well, like the impact level of their program. So whether it was an excellent outcome, um, a good outcome, or just sort of an okay outcome. And what you can see in um, the far left here um, is that women who were not care leavers and not youth offenders, um, the, over, the majority, 75%, had excellent outcomes in their program. Whereas if we look on the right, the far right bar, um, we see that males who were both youth offenders and care leavers, only about a third had an excellent outcome. And so um, this kind of, this, sit, this uh, sat with a, um, in line with some of their instincts that the, the young male um, uh, former youth offenders were having struggling in their program, um, but did give them a bit more data to support that hunch. And of course, it doesn't tell us why, but it does give them um, potentially the resources to try out changing their program in some way, potentially by having you know, more male role models working with their clients. Um, and so the, the last story that I will I'll tell you is about um, some work that we did with a food bank here uh, in the UK. So the Welcome Centre provides food parcels to people and they had noticed over the years that some people were becoming dependent on their services. So often, often people would come only once or twice to get a food parcel. Um, but uh, there were some people who would become dependent and come, you know, 10, 11, 12, sometimes even 13 uh, or 20 times uh, to get a food parcel. And they really wanted to help um, triage this and, uh, and, and be able to predict who was at risk of becoming dependent so they, they could um, prevent this potentially from happening. So we worked with them to work on a predictive model um, using information about the uh, client's 
So including demographic information and also about the, um, the number of times they've visited the food bank in the past to predict um, a risk score for each client as to their uh, the likelihood that they were going to become dependent. Um, and this model was deployed um, at the time point shown in uh, with the arrows who were in about 2018 and this is showing you the the number of, of referrals that were they were getting per client to the food bank and again we don't know for sure that this is the the, the cause but we did uh, we've observed like a flattening of the number of referrals per client suggesting that by being able to predict who is likely to become dependent, um, the Welcome Center has been able to um, reduce the number of, of referrals per client. Um, so lastly, I will just uh, talk a bit about how to get started. And I think, I think these suggestions hopefully apply um, both to data scientists who are interested in working with the social sector organizations and to people within organ organizations who don't necessarily consider themselves yet to be um, data scientists. So um, the few key lessons from us. Um, so, for, oh, there's a question in the chat as well. Uh, somebody asked, what was, the, what was the main reason why people were going to get food more than once at the food bank? Uh, that is a great question um, and actually not something that uh, we investigated uh, with this analysis, like uh, the motivation for um, the, the client coming back. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a great question. Um, I, I think I neglected to say that they were able to sort of predict uh, who was who at risk of coming back and then those people were offered um, a support support worker um, earlier in the process to help um, kind of give them individualized help. Um, so the thing that we learned along the way first is that it's not really about the data. Um, for us, the most important thing is to start with the question and I, it's so easy, I think, for people to come in with a kind of tech solutionism attitude um, uh, and we've also found, but we've also found that sort of organizations um, often struggle with defining the, the problem that they need help with. They might be aware of, you know, the, the wider range, range of data science techniques out there and they want to make use of data. Um, but for us, the most important thing is really defining the problem. Um, one tool that, that we found helpful is this uh, problem framing tool by Eddie Copeland, which helps you think about, you know, what, what problem would you like to solve? Like what, what kind of problem that has a, an action that you could then take, would you like to solve? What kind of, what would you do differently if you had different information? Uh, what would you need to see in order to uh, be able to make a decision better? And do you have the data in order to make those decisions? Um, a related thing is that when we work with an organization, uh, we assess um, their kind of data maturity using a framework that we, we developed a, a few years ago. Um, so for, for us, this goes back to the fact that it's not just about the data. It's, there's a lot of different components that enable um, effective data science to take place within the social sector. Um, so that can be culture. So, you know, having a curiosity based culture where people feel empowered to ask um, questions and want to make evidence based decisions. Um, all, but then also having the tools, the skills, buy in from the leadership, um, having the analysis uh, knowledge and skills as well. So um, we find that you know this is a helpful sort of framework to start with that you can you might find that you have a lot of, of data and tools but you don't necessarily have buy-in from senior leadership and and that can be a good place to start or or the other way around you might have a lot of buy-in but you need to invest the time in, in upskilling staff and giving them the, t the time and space to build on their own um, curiosity and learning um, the third thing is that uh, we think that responsible data use really needs to be uh, incorporated into data science right from the get-go. I, I mean, there's been lots of news stories about irresponsible data use in the corporate sector, and unfortunately, the social sector is not immune either. Um, so just two frameworks that I can um, point you to to start the conversation uh, are these consequence scanning and um, sense about science. I think th these frameworks don't provide any answers, but they kind of encourage you to ask questions like, where does the data come from? Was it collected with informed consent? 
um, what assumptions are being made about the data, uh, for example, what, who is assumed to be included in this data, who is not included, what are the consequences if we're making a decision based on this data set, especially if it's something like a rationing of a service, and what does it mean if the, if the model that we're using is wrong? And these are actually all questions that we talked about with um, the Welcome Center when we were working with them on the uh, food bank project, because there's definitely consequences to, um, you know, providing some people additional support and not others. Um, next piece of advice would be to start from where you are. And I think um, Zindi made a good case for this as well. Everyone's really on a, on a journey and um, you can find a lot of tools available for free that help you where you're at. So uh, taking time to sort of upskill through uh, online data science competitions like Zindi or Kaggle, um, you know, learning, um, there's a lot of uh, free resources online like to learn Python or R, which are two open source programming languages. You can develop your or your staff's interest in coding. Um, and then there's lots of support networks out there as well. Um, and then lastly, uh, we would encourage organizations to kind of make the case before uh, or maybe sort of walking before they run. So often we, we have organizations come in who think they need a full organizational overhaul, um, a full new data strategy. And what we found is helpful is just taking uh, one bit of data, finding something useful, finding a little bit of useful insight from it and sharing that with, the, with your community. Um, so start with one thing, do something useful and show it to people um, uh, in the organization in your, in your community and this will help make the case for future future data use within the organization and i think drawing on the on the kind of community of organizations both globally um, and within your uh, own particular nation is a great way as well to sort of gain support and, and make the case for data science use uh, so with that, um, I would happily take any questions. Um, I'm really enjoying learning more about uh, data science initiatives across Africa and, and in Namibia. And um, I, somebody asked to share your, my email. I am happy to do that. And you're welcome to email anytime. Do we have any more questions? Somebody asked if we have some success stories from Africa. Um, so we at DataKind UK have not as of yet partnered directly with um, any uh, African organizations though we are we're in some talks right now with um, an organization called city Can cancer challenge who um, help to develop um, uh, cancer care and cancer care infrastructure um, so I'm hoping that that soon we'll have <laughs> have some um, work there um, they we um, our global um, our, our global uh, data kind did some work with um, a charity called Give Directly, um, who were interested in identifying um, areas to be kind of targeted for a direct financial aid uh, based on a level of poverty. And they were kind of, they were using um, satellite imagery about uh, the, the structure of the, the roofing um, to help identify um, communities that might benefit from, I mean, I'm sure all communities at, around the world globally will generally benefit from more financial aid, but to sort of prioritize um, communities for financial aid um, through the Give Directly scheme. Um, so that's the one that comes to mind. We um, we are we are UK based, so um, we uh, we are also interested in things that have a global impact, and kind of happy to learn more and, and share stories.
Uh, somebody else has asked how DataKind deals with the issue of data protection and security. Um, this is a big question. <laughs> um, I guess uh, in the UK at least, there's some frameworks that we are uh, required to follow, um, put up by the government and GDPR regulation. Um, so that that is often a good starting point. Um, so we we kind of encourage organizations to look at the the framework put up by the ICO and the GDPR. And again, share those acronyms in, in the chat. Dulce? Yes. Does the UK have a data policy? Does the UK have a data policy? Um, there's, um, yes, there's a regulatory framework called uh, the General Data Protection Regulation Framework. Um, I will put that acronym, um, which tells you a lot about, you know, the kinds of data that you can collect um, and how and how long it can be stored and think rules about like people having the right to be forgotten and, and being able to opt out. Okay. Um, let's see. Where do we have any more questions? Okay, do we have any more questions or we can move on to the next speaker? Okay, thank you very much, Dulcy. If anybody has more questions, you can just uh, write it down and then the speakers will be able to see and respond to your queries. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. All right. So next up, we have Ms. Uh, Ipinge from Work Namibia. All right. Okay, how are you, everyone? Hello, everyone. I am uh, Rusa Itinge and um, I would love to send my greetings to everyone from different corners of the world um, during this pandemic, pandemic. So I hope we are taking care of ourselves. And before I start, I just want to say thank you, Delcy, for coming in. Thank you for all the speakers in the Africa. So today I'm actually wearing two hats. One is for, I'm an ambassador for Zindi Africa here in Namibia. And I am one of the founder for We Are Capable Namibia. Actually, I was a, a, a volunteer at some point at Data Kind UK when I was pursuing my studies in UK. So, and it's through that when I see the opportunity and see how people were harnessing data in UK and then I thought it's one of the most important thing and then I brought it to Namibia. So we started as a non-governmental organization called We Are Capable Namibia and uh, we could say our um, objectives um, is actually to use data in the um, uh, to encourage the use of data in um, solving humanitarian issues about poverty, human dignity, education, as well as environment. Um, so we are also uh, like doing these things through volunteer work. And unfortunately, it remain a challenge uh, knowing that in Namibia, we do not have much 
data scientist. So we ended up diverting our um, main core mandates, uh, which remains to create awareness to various organizations, private and as well as government, whereby we really mobilizing the use of data within institution across Namibia, as well as across Africa, just for decision making and as well for, for transparency as well as accountability. So now, what are some of our volunteer services throughout the year? So when we started, we started, we just have now one year, six months to say. So I, we have realized how much um, our current, our country is uh, struggling to understand what data science is all about and what uh, values can data add to maybe organization or the country at large. So we, we started um, approaching organization that they can actually invite us to their organization for awareness creation or for a talk for a period of two hours. We do this freely and voluntarily in any organization. It can be private, it can be government, it can be charity, it can be any organization. So just to go in and engage with or have presentations with people that are in positions such as statisticians or or whatever department, IT department, and just to ed educate people and engage with them on what data can, the value of analyzing data, what it can do to an organization. So uh, through that, we then realized that there was a need for us to come up with a community. So we started a community uh, which has been at one of the local university here in Namibia at NAST, where we now when we create awareness, when we go, when we visit different people, we tell them if they want to really explore more, they can join us to our community and we show them how to program using our Python programming language language and um, we, we, we have volunteers, we have been having volunteers that come in using different tools and having some data set and just to show people what data is all about and what values maybe can be delivered from data. So this community actually run every Saturday and it's done by volunteers here in Namibia, data scientists, as the few as we have maybe four or five in the country. So we meet, we invite everyone and currently it's only taking place in winter. In addition to that, we also host conferences and workshops. So these conferences um, um, are done twice in to say in a semester. So our main aim yet we're doing it voluntarily to invite because we we aim to engage organization managers and really to reach out to our government, especially people that are in decision making, just to show them how can data really improve um, uh, decision making. So we try to reach out to all these people and then invite them to conferences as well as workshops and just show them a real example of how to analyze or how to use this data for decision making. So we advocate data, open data. So we believe that any uh, organization might have public data. So we advocate for this public data to be open to public. So we try as well, again, to just engage with in different institutions on why it's important for them to open up some data for decision making as well as for better uh, research or to say what we call research-based decisions. So, and in addition, we also just felt like we cannot leave out our young, our young kids. So at some point we also just go in um, rural village like underprivileged kids and then we show them uh, the use of computers and then we maybe collect with them simple data at their level such as animals or maybe anything and, and just teach them what computer is all about. This is just to ensure that our next generation is actually well equipped with um, knowledge because we believe that these are likely to be the future leaders and already they should be part of uh, this data decision um, uh, based uh, task. So we have that small task that we do. 
Um, yeah, so that is some of the few tasks that uh, we are capable Namibia has been up to locally. Um, I will then continue um, to explain what has been our challenges. To be honest, doing all this work for the past three years, uh, I mean, for the past few, one year and some few months, it has been really just a voluntarily based uh, work. We do not have any funding. It's a commitment that just come from Namibian data scientists, which are really, really few. So we do not have any fundings. And also one of the um, challenge that we have is, um, um, we have we are very few data scientists in the country, like really, really few data scientists in the country. And it's on that aspect whereby we're trying to run all this community and trying to engage really Namibians so that they can have an interest on data science and maybe pursue it at a, 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 a at, um, educational level or the short course level or whatever method they chose to. And also one of the challenges that I've seen within our um, country is no culture really of um, evidence-based research and data-driven decision makings. So, and it's on that note where we really mobilize and try to engage um, um, uh, further uh, for, um, for, for us to, to be more engaging on data-driven decisions. And um, one of the challenges also, most people do not see the value of data. So we have a lot of work to do. And uh, companies are challenged with recruiting and retaining data scientists. And um, yeah, so these are some of the challenges that, that really we are, we are faced with, but we hope with the right support, we'll be able to go through these challenges. Okay, I am moving on to now. Uh, after mentioning that we have been um, offering all these uh, service voluntarily, well, lately we decided that um, we will be actually um, giving services to different companies on a certain um, minimum fee. For example, an organization which is maybe a non-governmental organization can invite us. Maybe they have a challenges which is key and maybe they want um, an assistance. They can actually invite us in and we have different um, categories of uh, minimum, very minimum fee on, um, on um, what maybe they can give us to, 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 to solve these challenges. This money actually will be used because since we do not have skills, we may be reaching out to organizations such as DataKind or Zindi Africa for them to come in or to make, um, to avail their data scientists to come in and solve these challenges. So we have a minimum and fee, and this is actually targeting some non-governmental, non-governmental organization and government at large, we charging a very, very minimum fee. However, with private organizations, as you could see, the fee is a bit high because we are not really a profit making, but if they want, since we have realized the need, if they need these services for us maybe to come in, so we are charging a very minimum very, very minimum fee for us to, to, to be able to help Namibia and improve some of the data sign um, data services. Okay, why well, work Namibia? Um, uh, like I said, today I'm wearing uh, two hats. So how now at a local level, we are here creating awareness and, um, and um, um, identifying Namibian challenges and also educating our Namibian people on the importance of data at um, a local level. However, if we found out that we are challenged, we have we have um, a support and this is when we invite bigger organizations such as that of Zindi Africa um, to come in and help us or to come in and provide um, maybe um, um, give this uh, 
um, trainee, I mean, um, providing um, an opportunity for our trainee to carry out um, this work. So we, as we train people, uh, in our community, we train them through the projects for Zindi Africa, as Amy explained. So we come together and then we wish to solve the challenges for Zindi Africa, meaning that we are solving Zindi Africa challenges as we learn. And uh, this, in this way, we are solving African challenges, all of, all of us together. So maybe you would want to know how can you get involved in some of We Are Capable Namibia. So if you are here and you are a volunteer, please go to our website that will be actually shared with you at the end of this. But if you are an organization and maybe you need a free awareness, please contact us as well through a website. And some of the services that we can do is such as providing a full day data phone to your institution or look at your proposed project and internal data sources or collaborate with your organization to help provide structures or top issues pressing within your organization or maybe you have issues with data cleaning or collections and uh, together with your organization we can discover new techniques that we are previously that were previously hidden or unknown to your organization so those are some of when you have some of those challenges that's some of the things or some of the reasons why you may contact us. Now, when different ways to join us. Being, I'm um, currently working as a lecturer at the Namibian University of Science and Technology. And this is um, independent whereby I have created a club for children to learn uh, data science and also encourage them to participate on Zindi Africa competition. So if you are an, a, 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 a student at NAS, please, you are advised to join this club. That is one of the tasks that I do on my own voluntary time at the university. However, if you are a community member, that is not a student, you can join our community classes. Maybe you want to learn data science, you can join our community classes for Work Namibia. So these community classes are offered on Saturday and we'll be communicating with you venue soon. And if you have a question and any clarity, please visit our website as shared here. And as well as you can send um, inquiry to jacopin at worknamibia.com. So please feel free. And yes, I'll be engaging with you uh, right now via questions. I thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Ms. Ipinge. Um, does anybody have questions or anything maybe that needs to be cleared? Okay, um, I have a question for Ms. Ipinge. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to know from their interaction with Namibian organizations so far, how are they receiving the message of, you know, moving towards a data-driven decision-making organization? Are they receiving it well, or is it just... Okay, okay thank, thank, you you very very thank you very much for the question. Sorry. Thank, thank you very you much for the question. question. Um, like I said, that is actually one of our challenges. Um, 
I'm sure it's a matter of time whereby actually organization would see the value that uh, data decision making will add to their institution. But um, I know it's not going to be an uh, overnight thing. And it's through that that we continuously continue to stand and mobilize and educating one on one with the hope that over a period of time will change the the mentality as well as um, um, uh, the, the, the whole behavioral sign of how people do things. So we, co we will continue. It's not an easy thing right now as it stands. So, but we are positive that if we continue mobilizing um, the use of uh, data, then we expect to yield maybe better results. And yeah, but there is few organizations really that are positive to our data science. I could say, although very few. Okay. Um, do we have any more questions? Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, I am not finding any other question. Anyone who has a question? Maybe one more question, Rosa. Um, quick question. Um, I mean, especially with our non, um, our public institution, most of their data sits on paper. Is there like any drive, do you know of any drive in Namibia to try and capture all this data electronically so it can be analyzed? Or are I'm we still? Sorry. I'm sorry, can you repeat your question, please? I'm saying in most of our public institutions, mm -hmm. our data sits on paper. Yes. Do you know of any drive to capture this data electronically so it makes it easy for analyzing it or nothing yes. yet? Yes, um, that, that was one of the thing and uh, through we have um, suggested um, such, such uh, issues like to different organizations like in government whereby we have volunteers and we, we give platform depending if data are not too personal that they can be captured by volunteers. Um, but currently how it stands, uh, people still uh, stand at a traditional way of completing data. Although some organizations really are migrating from these traditional methods to capturing data. So there is no really to say it's really depending on the first thing we need to do is influencing the people in power or the people in management to realize the need of data because from there it's when they will make decisions to know that they need to capture this data or to transform this data from traditional methods to computerized method. But at our level as an NGO, we may not really have much involvement on that, but we do advise organization to take that route. A uh, quick question, uh, Leslie here as well. Um, just maybe uh, in addition to what was asked earlier, um, I think the fact that, uh, you know, the data is usually in, in, in raw format or in, in, on paper as uh, the, the previous uh, uh, speaker asked. Mm -hmm. um, what, to what extent would you say, um, you know, like your advice to the public institutions um, is actually being embraced, right? In terms of uh, a scale zero to a hundred percent, are we getting through to them or, um, you know, we're hitting a brick wall and, you know, in as much as you're also saying it's not something you guys can, can really push as an NGO, but what other vehicle can we use um, to actually achieve that? I'm looking at this from uh, I think also the perspective of, um, you know, things like these pandemics and so forth, mm -hmm. um, data would be, would be such a good place to start, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of the information would then 
reside in uh, paper sheets, you know, somebody signing their phone number and so forth. So I don't mm -hmm. know, it's part question, part comment, but I think in terms of getting some traction, uh, we need to know, you know, like what can we do um, to, to, to get over this? Thanks. All right. As you have mentioned earlier, I mean, uh, sorry, not you, but uh, Dulcie mentioned from Data Kind UK. So she actually mentioned that UK is actually governed by the, the general data protection. And, you know, at the moment right now, Namibia, we do not have uh, the GDPR yet, or not doesn't have to be a GDPR, but we do not have any data protection policy in our country that actually govern uh, all this. And um, we need to start them. Um, and like I said, yeah, we need to start there to, to because right now it's, it's a very, it can be one of the complex tasks to do because organizations also maybe do not have something where they will be based on uh, where they are, the, the, their work or their decisions will be based on when it's come to data. So we need a data protection policy and it will, it will remain our responsibility. Really, we push, we, we mostly go to different, even OPM, we go to different organizations and we really tell them the need of this. And we hope over a period of time, uh, Namibia at large will realize the need of having all these things in place. All right. Was that the last question, I guess? Um, in conclusion, as Namibians, um, before I end, I just want to, if you are in an organization really and you know it's our responsibility you know if you really understand the use of this data um it will be good if you just take that initiative within your organization and educate people and really maybe show some cases you know it's hard to change the culture but over a period of time if you are persistent in your work and you know you are motivating it will be good if you continue um, showing different and uh, motivating people to, to, to carry out data decision making as well as to capture this data. Refuse doing things in Excel or in a piece of paper, you know. It starts with one person, but eventually over a period of time will reach the whole uh, nation. All right, I think I end here. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Ms. Ipinge. Um, now we can have our next speaker, uh, Mr. Mike, all the way from Uganda. Mr. Mike, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really very grateful to be here. Um, let me just share the slides and we start. It's going to be very short. So um, I'm going to talk about my data science journey, how I started up to a point where I am now currently and how it just been all along. All all yeah, so uh, I'm going to be talking about perspective of uh, African data scientists. So um, a quick intro about me is uh, I'm from Uganda and I'm an ambassador for Zindi. Uh, I co-founded a company called Medex International and the major problem which we are trying to solve was that uh, so in Uganda, I think Uganda is the second biggest country with the highest number of uh, gene expert machines for testing TB in Africa. I think it's following South Africa. So um, though we have a lot of, in Uganda, we have currently, I think, 250 gene expert machines across different regions in the country. 
So uh, the whole problem was uh, you get to realize these machines are not in all facilities in the country. So like uh, you may find in a specific region, maybe 10 or 20 different hospitals are sharing the same machine. And it could take a lot of time from the time somebody's sample is picked to a time when the results are delivered to that person or to that hospital. So what we thought was like, how do we automate this process and cut the turnaround time? So that if somebody is positive, we started with TB. So in, in case somebody is positive with TB, that is not going to spread it in the community. Uh, so uh, we are able to build a tool called Lab Expert, which retrieves uh, data from uh, the gene expert machine in real time. We aggregate the data and have uh, real time dashboards and models which do predictions in different areas. And also like from a patient perspective, immediately you, 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 your sample is tested. We send an SMS of your results directly to, to your hospital which send the sample and also to you notifying you that you know what, your, your results are ready. So like what used to happen was that uh, they could pick a sample, test it. After testing, the results are trans transported. It's paper-based. They are transported from the testing facility to a facility where the sample was brought up. So like in most cases, you could take uh, about three to five days from the time the results have been finished to be tested to a time when it reaches to a sample who is, who is a positive or to a, a client. So currently we have got the time and in real time, we transmit the results to, uh, to your facility and also notify you to go to your facility in case you're positive. If you're negative, we easily tell you that you, your test was negative, but we we'll advise you to go to your facility for more advice here. Yeah. So uh, outside that, uh, I do consult for Oxford Policy Management. It's based in the UK. So we do DFID work, Department for International Development in the UK. So currently I'm attached to Uganda and uh, Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is a small country near Australia. So um, I'm with the revenue, the, the two different revenue authorities, Uganda Revenue Authority and Papua New Guinea Revenue Authority. And also do some work for Patera Data Science. It's based in uh, Westville, Ohio in the US. Um, the tools which I use for work is uh, Scala and Python. And more interesting, uh, I lead the data science group in one of the largest data science groups in Uganda called Kampala uh, user group. So since this is still uh, towards uh, really encouraging other people and maybe sharing my experience, uh, I'm going to be talking from a, a personal perspective. So um, one, how do you move from wherever you are as an individual with your data skills to a level where you're exceptional? Like uh, most of the time you get to hear data science is the sexiest job of the 21st century. Wait a minute, what does that mean? If you pause and just listen to the sentence. Um, personally, I love the way data science have been, has been promoted. Uh, it has been really, they have used all good words. But um, the reality is that uh, nobody tells you how tough the journey might be in the middle. So like, um, there's one of the uh, books which I always refer people to, it's called The Deep. Uh, due to like, say an example, data science, given an example of uh, how it has been promoted, it's really very nice. So it really boosts you to start working on to it. Yeah, so like you need that boost. But as time goes on, as you continue with your data science journey, in most cases, things become so tough. Either there's too much to learn in the shortest time possible. There are a lot of the problems that the data to deal with. There are so many problems from an organizational perspective to an individual perspective. And in most cases, very, very few people survive the deep. The deep. Uh, so how do you get out of from wherever you are and still path through the deep and succeed as an exceptional person. So I have some few points. Uh, on my journey, one of the things which uh, I did, I, I remember when I was starting, uh, there used to be a group in Uganda. It was um, uh, organized by one of uh, 
one of one of the students was in the uh, University of Nevada, but he came back to Uganda for holidays. So he had a couple of friends who were based in Finland. So what he decided to do was to organize a group where they discuss more concepts. Uh, so I was also part of the beneficiaries of that. Um, and one thing which I really learned from the group was uh, in these groups, I believe even in um, Zambia now you have a group. I think the best way to learn always is by teaching others. Uh, and when you learn together, you cover a lot of things. Um, data science has so, so many things. Some things are so complicated, but if you learn it as a group, or if you work it as a group, in most cases, it becomes a little bit easier. Uh, then also another thing is like, uh, apart from the group, one of the areas which um, on a, an individual level, I focused on was looking on open data sets. So in Uganda, we have uh, uh, an open data set portal where they put most of the time government data sets and uh, also some non government organization that data sets called data.ug in Uganda here. So like in most cases, what you get to realize from uh, these data sets that they are so messy. And like, uh, I think some of my, most of my skill set, how I gained it was playing around with those data sets. And in most cases, government data sets, since they are messy, you learn a lot about how to manipulate data. Yeah, so um, I have participated in competitions and I love competitions. Um, you learn a lot from competitions. But one of the missing links from competitions is that, yeah, most, in most cases you get the data is pre-processed a little bit, even if it's not all that, it's pro but uh, working directly with some of these open data sets, you gain a lot of skill set. Um, also on a personal le level, I volunteered a lot with so many organizations and um, I'm so much grateful that for you in Zambia, you don't need even to look for in uh, Namibia, you don't need to really look for an organization to volunteer. With, you already have an organization which is calling for you to volunteer, which I think is really very good. You get to uh, work with different people with different skill sets, and in most cases, you learn a lot from that. Yeah. So another thing which I did uh, by then, like Zindi was not around. It was uh, Kago, one of the oldest that. Uh, that are, uh, that are competition platforms. Yeah, so like I participated a lot in, in um, Cargo, then later on when Zindi came, Zindi was really amazing. It was, it was speaking to most of the things which I understand so much well since I've stayed here, I know our African problems, yeah. So like, um, but one thing which I've learned from the Zindi competition, I currently participated, the last competition which I participated was the flood, uh, flood challenge. I, if any of you were through it, I think from the beginning towards, I think the third last day, we are, I think the top group. Then later on, I think either we overfitted our model so much, we came down to uh, tenth position. But as in one thing really which uh, I encourage, if you're going for competitions, it's good to go for competitions as a group. Uh, you really learn, learn a lot from those competitions. Then also, um, Another thing, if you're learning and you don't have directed learning, yeah, you, you might have a lot, lot of avenues, like say you're volunteering, you're participating in competitions, but also it's good to have like, say that go-to person whenever you have any problem. What I mean is that is a, a mentor, that person whom you can always reach out. Uh, it could be just a simple thing, but if you have a lot of guided la learning, you, t you will achieve a lot in your learning process and even if it's an organization, um, I encourage you. So like most of some of organizations, what they do is, is that they get like, say a group like one two, which will be more of like their mentors, they give them direction to us that. Um, another thing which I think from a personal level, which I think has accelerated my learning has been uh, staying humble. Uh, when you're with a group of people and in most cases, when you, you learn a lot, if you stay a little bit humble and like give people opportunities, in most cases, what happens is uh, data science is not like other uh, fields whereby like the more years you've been in it, the more experience you are, or the more that you know. So like this is a growing field. And in most cases, you might find that somebody has just started two or three months back, but he has something that you can learn from. 
Yeah. So um, in conclusion, what I could say uh, all is that uh, when, when you're learning, try to be as much patient as possible. Things might not work out the way that you want, but put the hard work. Um, I believe all will be possible. All the best, thank you. If you have any questions, you could ask. Uh, Mark? Yes, hello. Mark? Yeah, there are some, yes, yes. Um, yeah, on the chat message, there are some questions for you. Oh, yeah. So I'm seeing very informative slides from Mark on how to survive the deep. The problem is having so much online content to learn from. How can one mitigate that? Yeah, so like as earlier on, I said, yeah, there's a really a lot of content online. But uh, most of the time, uh, if you're learning and you have, say, a directed outcome, like say you're participating in a competition, and also you're having a kind of a mentor, in most cases, a mentor will tell you, you know what, at your stage where you are, first focus on two this, get this, after you get this, move to this next level. Yeah. Uh, second question, Mark, how accurate is your TB testing model? in comparison to lab results and what algorithms are you using in this regard. So um, the TB results, what we are doing is um, we retrieve the results from the machine, the lab machine which has tested. So after we have retrieved the, the, the results, we summarize it in dashboards, but like the predictive algorithms that were, the prediction level which we are using, the prediction problem that we are solving is, say uh, one of the things is, uh, the cartridges. So like a machine has a cartridge inside. There are cartridges which are used for testing in most cases. And like uh, government or like say in Uganda, we, we are co-partnering with the Ministry of Health in Southern Sudan. We're also working with um, the Ministry of Health and Kofi. It's a Japanese funding body. So like in most cases, they would love to know like say in a given period of time, say in the next six, six weeks, how many cartridges still shall we be having left? So in most cases, we give them that, those projections. So uh, there are a bunch of methods that we have used. I think it will be so long to talk about it. So uh, maybe directly to answer the question, it's not about like we predict whether you're having TB or you're not having TB. We retrieve the results from the lab machine in real time. Okay. Okay, do we have any more questions for Mark? Hi Mark, um, does Uganda have a data protection policy? Yeah, sure. Our parliament passed, um, uh, in 2019, our parliament passed a data protection policy. Yeah. I could share it with you if you're interested in. Yes, please. I think that would be very helpful. So um, I'm also seeing another question, which is about languages to pick either R, Python, or what, like. Uh, so, in a lang from a language perspective, what I would say is that uh, in most cases, get something that you're super interested. These languages are nearly the same. The same, the same things that you solve in Python, you can solve them in R. So, like, it's better first of all get one language get experience in three, then it will be easy for you to shift to other languages. But if you start learning all the two languages and all everything together, in most cases, you get confused and you'll not learn anything at the end of the day. Okay. Any more question for Mark?
Okay, if we don't have any questions for Mark, um, uh, we are over time, not over time, it's 3.30 and exactly at 3.30 and we are going to end our, our webinar. And uh, I would like to thank all the presenters. Thank you very much for your time and for enlightening us with what each organization is doing and what we can learn from everyone. Uh, thank you to Zindi Africa and um, Data Kind UK. You have shown us so many exciting projects that uh, you have worked on, be it in, in Europe or in Africa. And uh, for Mark, for informing us that it's always uh, good to work together and not work against each other, as we can achieve uh, a lot in that. Um, and uh, I think as a country, as Namibia, we can learn a lot from uh, what other organizations are doing and then we can implement it in Namibia. And uh, one of the really good examples is we need to take, um, we need to take a note of what Uganda has done. They have passed their uh, data protection policy. And I think that's what Namibia needs to move towards because I feel like most organizations, especially in the public servants, are reluctant in giving out their data because they feel like there's nothing that would protect them from if they give out this data. There is actually nothing that is going to protect them. And I think that as uh, Namibians, as a country, and that is the route we need to go, we need to advocate for um, a data policy and also uh, advocate for more people to join us so that we can solve uh, social and humanitarian challenges in Namibia uh, by just using data. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we'll share um, the presentation and as well as the, the Zoom um, record. record. Uh, I think Zindi will share it on their um, YouTube channel. Uh, we will also try and do the same and we'll also also share everything on Facebook, Twitter, and then uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us today. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to send us an email uh, at inquiry at work, uh, Namibia, uh, dot com. Um, but um, in the meantime, we will be having uh, we will have we will be having more of these discussions online so that we can engage and and uh, see how we can uh, follow up on what uh, we'll take from this uh, webinar for today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today.